This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. Today we're going to start a new topic called the World Wide Web. We're going to start by talking about the client-server model. This is a model for organizing services across a network. So in this model, we have two kinds of processes, servers and clients. The servers are processes that provide services over a network, and the clients are processes that utilize services over a network. They utilize the services provided by the servers. Now, servers listen at some particular reserved TCP or UDB port, or in some cases, both port kinds of ports. Listening means they're waiting for requests that come to those ports. Um, they may participate in more than one TCP connection at a time. And these servers are sometimes called, uh, well, often called daemons. And then in that case, their name ends in a D. So it looks like this, so the client would be called HTTP and the server would be HTTPD. Now, servers can be organized as actually a group of processes or threads. You, you often need a group of processes or threads because the server will handle multiple requests simultaneously. Now, the clients as I said, are processes that utilize the services. They can initiate connections to the servers. They ask for service. And they are usually assigned an ephemeral port. So an ephemeral port is a port that the operating system just hands to the client. It's used at that moment. Um, as opposed to a reserved port is a particular port that is given to the server on a permanent basis. Um, generally speaking, servers are much more complex than clients, and the burden of security falls mostly on the server. If you want your application to be secure, it mostly involves making sure that your uh, server works in a secure way. So if you're setting up a client-server application, these are the components that you need. You need a communication protocol. For web services, for instance, that's HTTP. Uh, you need a running server program. For web service, services, that's a web server. And you need more, one or more clients running client programs. For web services, that's a web browser. And then you need to set up communication channels, either via TCP or UDP. And usually you have a channel, one channel from a client to a server. But you could have, in some uh, protocols, you could have multiple channels. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is cloud computing. So what is cloud computing? So cloud computing is using data storage and computational resources that are provided by servers on the internet. Um, and usually you have to pay to have access to these servers, and they replace in-house computing services that an organization or a company would have. And it provides a way of sharing infrastructure among many clients. So the same infrastructure could be used by a variety of different clients, a variety of different organizations or companies. And this um, um, cloud computing provides various kinds of services you can store data. You can um, have access to particular software. This is called software as a service. You can ac have access to a virtual computer. This would be platform as a service. Or you can have access to the ability to create virtual computers as you need them. This is called infrastructure as a service. So cloud computing has certain advantages over normal computing. It reduces personnel and capital investment. 
you use cloud computing, you don't have to buy and, and maintain and manage uh, your, the, serv the server hardware because that's in the cloud. Someone else is doing it for you. So you have reduced management costs. Uh, you can have more and better quality of services. So it has all these advantages. The disadvantage is you're depending on someone else for privacy and security. You don't have the same kind of management control that you would otherwise have. And because everything is being done over the internet, you have reduced computational speed. Okay, so I have a question here for you. Um, this question is, uh, the internet is a blank virtual computer network and your choices are connectionless, connection oriented, both connectionless and connection oriented or none of the above. So I'll give you a moment to answer that question. Okay, welcome back. The answer is both A and B, depending on what layer of the internet you're looking at. So let's review the internet layering model. So here are the layers. We have hardware, the network interface. This is a layer that connects um, the layer where we can talk about how uh, hosts are connected to um, physical networks. We have the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. At the internet layer, at this layer, the internet works as a connectionless network at this layer it works as a connection oriented network. So at each layer we have different data units. At the hardware we have some kind of signal that could be a microwave signal or electronic signal. At the network interface we the data unit is a frame and at the internet level it's an IP datagram. At the transport ladder, level it's either a TCP segment or it's a UDP datagram. And then there's many protocols, but here are some of the main protocols. At the network letter, we have ARP. ARP allows us to match up physical addresses with IP addresses. And at the internet level, we have IP and ICMP. IP is the main protocol. ICMP allows us to deal with problems that we have in the, using IP. And then for transport, we have two versions, TCP and UDP. TCP provides all kinds of reliability. UDP provides no reliability. And then we have various application protocols like HTTP for web services. And then for addressing, we have at the network interface level, we have physical addresses. Um, what kind of addressing depends on the kind of technology for the phys underlying physical networks. At the internet level, we have IP addressing, and for the transport level, we have protocol ports. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the domain name system. So if we just go back up here, we see we have an addressing system at the internet level. This allows us to assign names to network interfaces and these uh, names allow us give us a way of identifying hosts on the internet um, and we talked about how these addresses are 32 bits divided into four octets if you look at an IP address it really doesn't tell you much it's just four different numbers and so they're not very useful for communicating to people you know which machines are which machines so we have another system called the domain name system. And this is a system for providing names for hosts as well as collections of hosts. And it provides a way of mapping host names, IP name addresses and vice versa. You can map um, IP addresses back to host names. You can also give alias, aliases to host names. So, for instance, many computers uh, have a particular name, and if they're using being used as your web server, they have another 
alias that starts off with web. Well, actually, not web. www usually could be web, but www. Maybe I'll make that clear. So it starts off with www. And then the rest of the name. Um, and there's also information that could be stored with hosts and collections of hosts, like the mail exchange servers that particular hosts are using. Now, this big domain name system, it's managed by a set of name servers. And each of these servers is responsible for some part of the system. And the name servers communicate with each other using both TCP and UDP. And the name servers do lookups by a recursive search. They basically look through their data, and if they don't have the information they need, they will ask other servers to look for information and look, help them look up what they're looking for. And sometimes this can start at a root server. A root server is a name server for the whole domain name system. And there are several root servers uh, scattered across the internet. Uh, now, one thing that happens is when answers to name lookups are found, these names are off, often cached. Uh, that way, you don't have to go through this recursive search over and over again. Once you found the information, it's cached locally, and you can use that. Now, domain names consists of sequence of labels separated by dots. Now, the first thing to know is IP addresses are numbers separated by dots, but the domain name has generally, its structure has nothing to do with the structure of IP addresses. So the domain name looks like this, and each suffix is also a domain name. So this is also a domain name, and so forth. Every suffix is a domain name. And the whole name here is a subdomain of its suffixes. And so a domain name is a name for an individual host, or it's a name for a group of hosts. So just by looking at the name, uh, Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's a domain, domain name for a collection of hosts or a single host. Uh, so for instance, my, my uh, uh, web server machine, which is called Hygelac, its name is this, hygelac.cas.mcmaster. CA. And if we look at this, this is a domain name. That's basically, roughly speaking, the domain name for Canada. This is the domain name for the machines at McMaster. This is the domain name for the machines in the Department of Computing Software. And finally, the name of my machine is Hygelac. An interesting thing about this machine is it is a virtual machine. There is no hardware machine running, but there is a virtual machine. Um, okay, so this is how domain names work. Uh, and there's some particular top-level domain names, like in this case, let me use a different color. This is the top level domain name. That's always the, the one that's first on the right. That's the top level domain name. And these top level domain names come in three kinds. There's the generic top level domain names, country code top level domain names, and there's infrastructure top level domain called ARPA, which uh, is just for uh, network structural uh, use. Now, originally there were six generic top-level domains, com, 
net org edu gov email and these were basically used by the United States mail was US military gov was US federal government edu or US educational institutions com were US companies net were organizations connected with uh, the internet and org were miscellaneous organizations and the interesting thing is when I worked in industry, I worked at a company called MITRE.ORG. That was its domain. And at the time, there were very, very few uh, domains in ORG. ORG was pretty well empty at the time. This would have been back in the 80s. Okay, well, things have changed quite a bit since these original six. Now what we see are with, they've been expanded. Um, I guess people thought it wasn't fair that these were being mostly used by the U.S. So they've been expanded, and now there's all kinds of these. There's basically over 1,500 of them. Uh, there was a lot of arguing at first about them, but now it's, it's pretty free. There's a lot of these of all different kinds. Now, in addition to these, there are the country code top-level domains. There's 312. Um, these are codes of particular countries, like there's CAS, DE for Germany, UK for the United Kingdom, US for the for USA. Uh, often when you see something like this, uh, it will mean that it's at the state level, if it's at the uh, national level, it might be something like this or something like this. But it could work both ways. Now, EU is the country code for the European Union, even though the European Union is not technically a country. Okay, uh, we're going to stop here and we're going to continue next time talking about where the World Wide Web came from.